The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle Hebert, Director of Communications here at Saney's, and I want to welcome you to another Lunch and Learn session in our Financial Friday series. Saney's is excited to offer these sessions in cooperation with our corporate partner, AXA. AXA has a longstanding presence in New York, and a large portion of AXA's New York client base is built upon the work they do with the public education system. Through AXA, SANES members can receive competitive insurance rates and a full array of retirement services, including a complimentary financial profile for SANES members, which we urge you to take advantage of. It's a great benefit. Our AXA presenter today is Keenan Miller, a regional vice president with AXA from the Binghamton office. Now, before we get started, please note that participants are muted during the session. However, we'll save some time at the end of the presentation for some Q&A, and you can certainly follow up with Keenan after the webinar with your particular questions. If you do want to participate in the Q&A, we'll simply have you type a question in the Q&A box on your control panel. Now, we are recording this session, and it will soon be available at sanius.org. And you'll also find at sanies.org under Resources AXA, you'll find a list of AXA advisors in each region of the state that you can contact. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Keenan. Great. Thank you, Michelle. And welcome to all of you. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me maybe on your lunch break. Uh, very excited about sharing some information with you today. Uh, which hopefully can impact your lives positively. And in preparing for today, I was thinking about my, my own life uh, and the preparation that I have made. A little background on myself. Yes, I work here in Binghamton, grew up, was raised here, moved off, and then moved back as my family grew. My family consists of my wonderful wife of 17 years in a row. And uh, we have seven beautiful children, so we own about half of our school district, and I am so pleased uh, when I see that yellow bus pull up in front of my house and haul them all off to school in the morning, and very appreciative of all the work that all of you on the other end of this line do uh, day in and day out through uh, the school year in providing good resources and benefits to my kids. So today is a privilege giving back to you and sharing some information on how maybe you can help uh, battle some of the costs of, of, of college and, uh, and really getting yourself uh, prepared and set for your financial uh, plans here. So I do want to reiterate that there will be a Q&A at the end if we have time. But however, I, I know a lot of you are going to have uh, some specific questions on your own personal planning, and uh, that might be more appropriate for a one-on-one -on -one discussion with a financial professional. So I'll do my very best to keep the information general and guide you in the right direction, but with the understanding that it's a good idea to always follow up afterwards with me or if you have a financial professional already uh, to do so with them. So let's get going here. Um, so college has always been or has been seen uh, in the past as a doorway to security and prosperity. You know, college is now viewed in most circumstances as almost a minimum requirement for a promising career. And many parents see it as the last largest planned financial responsibility to prepare their children for independence. Now, it's important to note that this means different things to each of us, depending on your values and your budget, this concept of financial responsibility. Well, it might mean that some of you are saying, hey, I want to plan for four years of private college for my children plus grad school. And in other circumstances, it might be just four years of public school. Uh, some clients that I've worked with say, I would like to just build a nest egg, and whatever it is, it is, and I pay for X amount of dollars of college or I'll pay up to half, and the other half is, is my child. So uh, there's all different kinds of strategies. There's no right or wrong amount or philosophy. And the point is here is that simply we're going to, or you should be identifying your goals and based on your own values, and then determine what the target is and build a plan to hit that target.
Today, we're going to review some of the current information on college prices and some of the issues facing prospective students. And then we'll take a look at a few traditional sources of funding for college and discuss creative financial strategies and how to accumulate dollars. And then from there, we'll review some popular education planning vehicles, including advantages and limitations of each. And then finally, we'll talk about how college planning fits into your overall financial strategy and give you some actionable steps you can begin to take once uh, our session today is over. Now, college campuses are becoming busier and busier and certainly more expensive. In 2017, some 20.4 million students were expected to attend American colleges and universities. Now, a staggering number of 72% of all undergraduates received some type of financial aid, broken down as 63% receiving grants, 38% some kind of student loan, 5% received aid through a work-study program, 3 received federal veterans education benefits, and 4% had parents who took out federal direct plus loans. Now we're hearing a lot of college, <clears throat> that college is expensive, but what does that really mean? Well, if we look at the chart here in 2007 and 8 school year, average tuition fees Excluding other college costs, such as room and board, okay, for a four-year public college was roughly $7,300, and for a private college, you're looking at $27,500. Now, 10 years later, tuition and fees continue to increase, both for four-year private universities and for public schools. So the question really is, is there is an increase, and it looks like it's going to continue to increase. So how do we pay for it all? The most well-known choices for college funding include some savings, of course, scholarships, grants, and loans, which we just discussed. But depending on your situation, these options may not be as abundant or as attractive as you think. So some things to consider here. Inflation, scholarships, grants, and loans. So when we were talking about savings a moment ago, it goes without saying that, well, that's important. But if you continue on saving, just saving a loan to cover tuition costs, you have to consider that college prices generally rise faster than the rate of inflation. So inflation in 2007 and 8, between that time and now, published in-state tuition fees at public four-year institutions increased on an average of 3% or 3.2% beyond inflation. So if inflation is like roughly 2%, we've got a 5.5% five, five increase in college expenses year after year. Now we look at private scholarships. But in 2016 and 17 school year, for instance, only 6% of undergraduate students were awarded these scholarships. So a small percentage of people are being awarded something that many people are counting on. Grants, like Pell Grants, too, are available, but many of the grants are awarded to families with incomes below 50000 And the maximum Pell Grant in 2017 and 18 school year was just shy of $6,000, so it's the maximum amount. As increases or as income rises, the amount becomes smaller, the grant amount, if you're even eligible at all. Well, and then there's loans. So loans may seem an attractive way to learn now and pay later, but using them as a primary source of college funding can make college even more expensive than it already is. So loans should be seen as a supplemental source Best entered into with good information and clear sense of repayment terms. So on the front end of this, it might seem a little daunting or discouraging. It's a little heavy handed. Um, the lesson here is to avoid relying too much on the options that we just talked about. Instead, let's consider how to invest in a vehicle that might keep pace with that inflation, such as a tax-advantaged or a high-interest-bearing options. 
So think of scholarships and grants as maybes. In fact, when you are putting a college funding plan together, you may want to assume that you won't be the recipient of any of those grants. So it'll be the cherry on top. This will help prevent you, <coughs> excuse me, help prevent your investment plan from, from falling short in any way. So hoping for the best and planning for the worst is what I like to say. So to avoid accumulating large debts and paying out additional monies in interest, it's best to view loans as the last resort. So let's discuss some of the education planning investments that can potentially help your money grow and compound. Okay, so we got some funny names here, UTMA and UTMA, which is a Uniform Gifts to Minors Act and a Uniform Transfers to Minors Act. Basically, they're custodial accounts that enable minors to own securities. Now, we'll go into more depth on these in a minute. The next is a Coverdale Education Savings Account, formerly called Education IRAs. They also have a tax advantage, and they are an investment account. And then there is what is popularly known as the 529 plans, which are investment plans that allow federal tax-free savings for college. So the UGMA and UTMA, um, how they work is that an adult sets up in a custodial account on behalf of the minor. And the minor is considered the owner of the fund is, <coughs> pardon me, of the fund as soon as the account is open, regardless of the age, and the minor has full access and control over the funds at the age of majority, which is usually 18 to 21, somewhere in there. A provision that steers a lot of people away from this is that they uh, want to remain in control of those funds and don't necessarily at that age want to turn uh, maybe what could be a very large account over to uh, their son or daughter. Higher income families have been attracted to these, however, since there's no income limits for contributions, which there are in other cases, and we'll see that in a moment. Now, turning over to the Coverdale account, um, formerly known as the Education IRAs, a parent or contributor opens the account for the purpose of saving for a specified beneficiary uh, for their education. So, Annual contribution limits is $2,000 for each beneficiary, regardless of how many CSAs they have or, or Coverdale accounts. No contributions are allowed for those with household incomes over $110,000 for single filers or $220,000 for married joint filers. How, withdrawals, however, they're tax-free as long as they are used for specified beneficiaries' education purposes and withdrawals that are not used for educational expenses, well, they're taxable and may be subject to additional federal income tax penalties. So again, when setting these up, we want to make sure you're sitting with a financial uh, advisor and maybe even a tax consultant to make sure that these are exactly what you need and they're used for their specific purposes. Now the Coverdale account cannot be rolled over to a 529 plan directly such as a transfer of funds between IRAs. However, you may have funds distributed from and then invested into a 529 plan tax-free if done so in a timely fashion. The next is the, the popular 529 plans that I uh, mentioned before. The 529 plans are increasingly popular method for college investing, and generally they allow more flexibility than the other accounts we've already discussed. So the 529 plans are state and school-sponsored accounts, and so they, they vary from plan to plan. And most plans generally allow large contribution amounts up to $350,000 per beneficiary, but that's state specific, and there are no income limits. 
The 529 plan withdrawals, uh, withdrawals for education expenses are federally tax-free and in most cases can be state tax-free. The states also may allow state tax deductions for contributions uh, for the residents of that state as well as other incentives such as scholarship funds. Now, if you're investing in a 529 plan outside of the state of residence where you live, you may lose available state tax benefits. So make sure, again, that you consult with your tax advisor and be sure that you understand your, your state tax laws to get the most out of your plan. Now, other additional reasons for the 529 plan is that the contributor maintains control over the funds even when the child reaches college age. The 529 plans also offer a high degree of choice and flexibility, so funds can be used at accredible institutions other than the four-year colleges or universities as well, and can also be redirected to other beneficiaries such as siblings or cousins without setting up a whole new account, which is really nice. So if you're like me, and you have a whole spread of children, and you got one who is 16, and you got one who is one, I can use the same account for both, and I don't have to set up several different accounts. The accounts are easy to set up, and they have low minimums and high maximum contributions, but always check the terms of the applicable plan you're considering. And then 529 plans are professionally managed as well. So Investors can choose how to allocate the funds based on their risk tolerance, meaning how aggressive or how conservative they would like to be. And in addition, nearly all states have adopted the investment concept of age banding, which basically means is you have a young child and they have a lot of time ahead of them prior to college, in some cases 18 years. They could be more risky, and as they get closer to that college date, the funds in themselves become more conservative as we're plan planning on uh, distributing those funds. So this, this concept seeks to achieve a higher rate of growth when the time horizon is longer and reduce the investment risk as the child nears that college age. So of course, there's no guarantees in any of this. The level of investment return or growth can be achieved by any by any given time, including a time when the child is ready. Okay, so moving to on, of course, I mean, with with these types of counts, the course, um, of course, uh, with the advantages that we've just covered, there are also some fees and expenses and other factors to consider with the 529 plans. Uh, the plans are subject to any or all of the following fees, ex expenses, enrollment fees, administrative fees, and management fees. So in addition, non-prepaid 529 college saving plans are subject to market risk, which means that at any time the value of the plan may be worth more or less than the original investment. So in other considerations of the HOPE scholarship or the lifetime learning credit, if you're, if you're in the planning process now, you're familiar with these, if either one of these is claimed for the same qualified higher education expense, as though what you're withdrawing the 529 funds for, the withdrawal may be subject to taxation. Similarly, if you withdraw funds for qualified expenses from both the 529 plan, and the Coverdale savings account, a portion of the distributions may be subject to tax and penalty on amounts that exceed a qualified higher education expense. Now, your state may also offer a college savings plan with a state advantage, <coughs> with a state advantage uh, for its residents, such as state tax deductible contributions. And by investing in a plan outside your state of residence, you may lose any state tax benefits. So um, it's a good idea if you, your children, if you're living in New York State, 
and you're a resident of New York State, look into the New York State plan. In addition, not all states allow for state tax-free distributions of earnings, withdrawals from earnings not used to pay for qualified higher education expenses are subject to tax and penalty. There's a couple different kinds of, of 529 plans. Okay, you've got your prepaid tuition plan, which are basically you lock it in today in today's tuition rates. And the plans guarantee that the account growth will match that of the state's tuition inflation. Very few requirements, uh, very few require the beneficiary to attend an in-state school as well. However, not all states have these plans, so again, a little research here will do you well. The second type is a college savings plan. They've been more popular in strong markets. They have the potential to generate higher returns and growth than prepaid tuition plans, but carry a little bit more investment risk. Both types offer benefits to contributors through reductions in their state, the state taxes. Generally gifts up to the current amount of $15,000 are free of gift taxes. And contributions of any amount are removed from the contributor's estate. This has made 529 plans more popular for grandparents as well as parents. A financial professional is going to help you determine which is the best, again, as always. It's my little disclosure there. So let's review some of the things that we've talked about. Based on current costs and projections, the price of college education is likely going to continue to increase. And if your college plan currently assumes that a large portion of funding will come from loans, grants, and scholarships, well, you may have to make a little adjustment. All right. You want to re-examine your complete financial situation to decide which of the ones that we cover, the Ogma or Coverdale savings account, the 529 plans can help with your college planning. For example, your household income will pay a, play a big part in determining what options you have. High income earners lose the ability to contribute to vehicles such as the Coverdale accounts um, and are usually ineligible for any kind of financial aid and are not able to receive certain education tax credits. So one example there. You may also want to look at the effects of each funding vehicle and how, what it has on the estate and tax strategies. <clears throat> There's one other important point I'd like to stress, the actual advertised price tag is not necessarily what many families will pay given the ability to, of, of financial aid and the possibility of scholarships. Okay, so the reality is that qualifying for these financial aid packages is by no means a given. So here's a catch-22. By the time you know whether or not your child can take advantage of them, it would be far too late to make other plans. So what's the point? Um, Start now. Start thinking about this now. We don't know what's going to be available in the future. So if you are able to plan now, that's better than waiting and assuming something is going to happen for you later. Now, if you've already set up a college funding strategy, now is a good time to review your plan of action. Will all the new tax laws and the changes to education funding products and the markups, the market ups and downs, what might have been the best strategy a few years ago may be outdated at this point, and what you set up now might be a little outdated a few years from now. So you want to stay on top of this. If you've not yet set up a college funding strategy, now is also a good time to begin evaluating those goals. Secondly, keep your education funding goals in perspective with other financial needs, like college and a secure retirement is costlier than ever before. So with people spending more years in retirement and more and having a more active lifestyle, you want to make sure you don't plan for one goal at the expense of the other. So this is where professional guidance comes in and professional can really help guide you in all of these areas. 
So uh, many of you have been on these calls before. I'm not going to go through this because there's uh, one slide I do want to hit prior to us uh, leaving today, which is AXA does provide a scholarship. AXA's equitable uh, commitment to its customers extends to the communities we serve. We've got good corporate citizenship has been our core value since the company was established over 150 years ago. So our philanthropic program, AXA Achievement, it's an initiative of AXA Foundation. And it reflects who we are and what we do as a company. So just as AXA Equitable is about wealth and management and financial strategies, AXA's Achievement offers scholarship awards as well as help navigating the complex process of college selection. Our AXA Achievement has awarded over 25 million to more than 6,000 students nationwide. And AXA Equitable is one of the nation's largest corporate providers of scholarships. Our scholarship winners are known as AXA Achievers, our young people who have all accomplished something special. And it's not necessarily just designated to, to grades, but we are looking at what students are doing in their communities and how they are going out of their way uh, to make a difference in other people's lives. We look for the extraordinary efforts. So it's, I would encourage all of you to look into the scholarship and we can provide you more information as well. So, you know, college funding, um, you know, we've covered a lot today. I'm gonna, we have a couple of minutes here for uh, Q and A. Uh, hopefully this was helpful and the information that I provided will bless you in some way. And again, we, uh, I and my team will be available offline for any specific uh, questions as we go forward. So let me open up to a little Q&A. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions? You'll want to type them in your questions panel at this time. Folks, a second to type here if there's anything. Nothing? And I guess you were pretty thorough because we don't have any questions here. I know it was a lot of information. So, uh, like I said, the best bet is to sit down and take a little time, answer uh, some some questions, uh, and ask some questions with a financial professional, and make sure that you're on par. But don't 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 wait. I wouldn't wait. Uh, time uh, could be for you or against you, and if you wait, it'll certainly be against you. So, make some good decisions today. Start planning today. All right, we do have one question that came in. Um, a couple are coming in now. Is it recommended to diversify? Uh, diversify within the, so absolutely. So you, within the, um, any of these investments, you have a little bit of control over, or you have a lot of control over what type of investment you can put inside of these shells. So the 529 would, would be a type of shell like an IRA or a 401k where you can choose uh, the risk that uh, you're looking to take on. And within that risk with your financial professional, you can determine uh, what type of fund or stocks or whatever you would like to put into that shell. And so, yes, I would certainly diversify because um, you never know what's going to happen with one particular fund company or with one particular company in general. We want to diversify our funds and uh, across all markets. Um, and, and another question is, I currently have a 529 plan. Some people mention life insurance policies that, allow, that are allowed to be used for college. Yes, and so that is a possibility. And that is, all of these are going to be uh, on a particular, uh, it's going to be individualized for each individual person and their circumstances. But in general, if you have the time, I think that is a way that you can because you're going to um, shelter a lot of monies uh, and can build up the cash inside of those policies, but you're, you need time on your hands. So typically I would say that if your student or if your child is, you know, I would say within five years, uh, five, four, three years of, of college is probably not a great idea in the sense that a 529 might be better in the sense that you're going to receive more tax advantages in that way. But regardless, that is one of the things where you're going to sit down and need to have that discussion independently uh, with your financial provider and determine what situation you're in and what your goals are and how to achieve those. But 
to answer the question, that is a potential uh, opportunity there or potential investment that you could use a, a life insurance policy. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, Keenan. Um, so as we mentioned before, if you go to the Saney's website, under resources, and you'll see an access section there, and you can find your list of advisors uh, to contact for further questions. So we hope you'll join us for the next Financial Friday webinar on Friday, June 15th, two weeks, when we'll talk about pension maximization for civil service employees. Um, so with that, we're going to conclude and have a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.